But there's a great leadership quote that says, there are three kinds of people. Those who watch things happen, those who wonder what happened, and those who make things happen. That same thing has been said in different ways by many great leaders throughout history. Tomorrow we celebrate Martin Luther King Day. One of the things that Martin Luther King is famous for is a speech that he gave in 1963, which was titled, I Have a Dream. He had a dream of a better world than the world that he was living in. And he started working towards that. It wasn't just a dream. He said, I am going to do my best. I'm going to put in my effort. I'm going to invest my life into making this happen. And a lot of the things that he dreamed of didn't even happen in his lifetime. But it was his dream and his work that helped pave the way for that. In fact, some of the things he saw in his dream haven't yet completely come to pass. But he was willing to invest to make those things happen. Senator Robert F. Kennedy, in his bid for president of the United States in 1968, used an adaptation of a quote by George Bernard Shaw as his campaign theme. And actually, his brother, JFK, had also used a different variation of this um, when, when, when he was in office. But his slogan for his campaign was, some men see things as they are and say, why? I dream of things that never were and say, why not? Last week, we started a series on Nehemiah that I titled, Looking Past the Rubble. Nehemiah is known for rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem that had been torn down many years earlier by the Babylonians. The walls had been a pile of rubble for over 150 years before Nehemiah took on the task of rebuilding. Many people had seen the pile of rubble, but to most people, that's all it was, a pile of rubble. And my tablet decided to freeze up on me again. It was just a pile of rubble. Nehemiah said, there's more to it than that. It may be a pile of rubble now, but it can be more than a pile of rubble. It can be something great. And so he got on his knees as we talked last week. He got down on his knees and he prayed. He said, God, what can we do about this? Now, we don't know his exact prayer. At first it says he he fell down and he wept. And he meant to cry out to God. We have the last part of his prayer, which we got to last week. But for four months, he fasted and he prayed. And he said, I'm not happy with what's here. Nobody was happy with what was there. But he said, I know it can be better. Something needs to be done. And so he cried out to God. And he let God share his vision. And Nehemiah caught God's vision. And then Nehemiah said, okay, I've got the vision of what it can look like. Now I'm going to do something. I'm not just going to continue to pray because sometime during that process, God also said, okay, this is the vision and you're the man to do it. So he got up off of his knees and he said, I will be the one to fulfill that vision. I will be the one to make that happen. To a lot of the people, all they knew was the pile of rubble. It had been there for 150 years. At least one whole generation had grown up. That's all it was. We have people in America and in other parts of the world that are living in rubble, or they're, I mean, whether it be physical rubble or spiritual rubble or whatever it may be, there's some kind of devastation all around them. And they don't even know that there can be anything different because that's all they know. They just think this is normal. No, it's not normal. Some of us know differently but it's never going to become normal. It's never going to become better unless somebody says, I've got a vision for a better future. I will do something to bring that future to pass. There were some that just accepted the fact that even though they didn't like it, this is the way things were. And there's nothing they could do to change it. There were a few that maybe asked why. Why did God allow this to happen? Why is it the way it is? But they didn't go beyond that. There were probably some people saying somebody needs to do something about this. But they wouldn't roll up their sleeves and do it. Nobody seemed to be able to see past the pile of rubble. They saw the rubble. But Nehemiah said there's something beyond that rubble. The story of Nehemiah began with Nehemiah hearing about the condition of the city. He hadn't even seen it with his own eyes. But in his heart, he knew that what he had heard from his brother about the condition of the city wasn't right. So as I've already said, he spent four months simply crying out to God. And over the course of that time, God birthed a vision inside of him. 
Nehemiah still saw the rubble. He didn't deny the rubble wasn't there because that's what some people do. They try to deny it. They try to ignore it. I'll just pretend it doesn't exist. Well, pretending something doesn't exist doesn't make anything better. Nehemiah admitted there's a pile of rubble. But he said, I'm going to do something to change that. I'm going to do something to make it better. He had a dream for the future. He saw what could be. But he didn't just see a vision of the future. He said, if that future is going to come to pass, I need to be part of making it happen. I will do something. See, it's not enough to simply dream of something better. How many of you dream of a better world? How many dream of a better country? Maybe you even dream of a better job, a better career. Dreams are great. But unless we start working towards that, we'll never have anything better. See, there are a lot of people who are stuck in a dead-end career. They don't really like what they're doing, but it's all they know. And they say, I wish I could have something better. Well, maybe you could, but maybe it's going to take going back to school. Maybe it's going to take doing something different than what you're doing now, because things don't just change. We have to do something to make them change. Things don't just happen because we wish them to happen. Things happen when we step out of our comfort zone and begin to make sacrifices, do something different. That's when things change. So to the end of Nehemiah chapter (coughs) 1, Nehemiah had decided that he, with God's help, will be the one to rebuild the walls. And in the last verse of chapter 1, we read last last week, that's where we ended the story. It says in, in verse 11, the second part of the verse, give your servant, Nehemiah is talking about himself, so he's saying, give me, give your servant success today by granting him, Nehemiah, favor in the presence of this man. And we talked briefly last week, what, what he meant by this man, what man? The king. And then he ends chapter one with, I was cupbearer to the king. Nehemiah had already made the decision that instead of just praying about the problem, he's going to do something about it. But there are some obstacles that need to be overcome first. The first obstacle was his job, or more specifically, his employer, the king. Now, when we think about a cupbearer, we think butler. But in those days, a cupbearer was more than just a butler. In fact, being a cupbearer was a coveted position. It was actually a job that people wanted, especially if you could be the cupbearer for the king. But there were drawbacks. I mean, the cupbearer's primary primary responsibility was to keep the king safe by sampling anything that was given to the king. And even though they're called a cupbearer, that generally included more than just drink. It also included food. Anything that was served to the king, the cupbearer would first sample it, and if he lived, it was safe for the king. So it was kind of a dangerous job. I mean, the king had guards. He had bodyguards to protect him from physical harm. I mean, they're going through metal detectors, and well, I guess they didn't have those back then. But if you wanted to cause physical harm to the king, you're going to have trouble doing that because he's got his, his mafia guys there to protect him. The only way you could really harm the king was to poison him. So people would slip something, either to get somebody in the kitchen to, you know, pay them off, to put something in the, in the meal before it's served. Of course, that person, you know, is taking a chance of their own life if they do that. Or when nobody's watching, putting something in the, in the, the food or the drink. So the cupbearer's job was to sample it. And if it's okay for him, then it can go to the king. That part of the job doesn't seem to be glamorous. But there were perks to the job. And this is why people wanted the job. First off, it was a very well-paid position. Nehemiah, as I said last week, was not a slave. He wasn't simply a servant. He got compensated very, very well. It was a very high-paying position in the kingdom. In fact, one of the top-paying positions in the kingdom at that time. And we'll get to that as we get farther into the story of Nehemiah, because we're going to see that Nehemiah, out of his salary, pays for a lot of stuff because he was compensated well. Next thing is, Nehemiah got to eat at the king's table. Anytime the king is having a meal, Nehemiah gets to have a meal. And whatever the king eats, he gets to eat. Whatever the king drinks, he gets to drink. I mean, he's living it up. He's got the high life. He's got a a 10-course gourmet meal every time he sits down at the table. Of course, he's testing the king's food. 
The cupbearer had to be trustworthy because they heard top secret conversations. Usually the cupbearer, even though he may, it may not be in his job description, became an advisor to the king. The king would have his advisors, but the cupbearer became an advisor simply because he was so close to the king. He was with the king for all the private meetings. Because anytime they had meetings, they had a snack or they had a you know, bottle of water or something. You know, Think about it, when you go to a meeting, you always have something, right? Coffee, something to drink. So he's at every meeting. So he's hearing all these conversations. And history says that usually the cupbearer ended up being an advisor, even though it wasn't his official capacity. You know, when they got in, they got in private, the king would say, what, what did you think about that conversation? What do you think I would do? And the king could either take it or leave it. But they became an advisor. <coughs> A good cupbearer could actually help set the direction of the country by giving wise counsel to the king. And because the cupbearer knew so much and kept so many secrets, it was not an easy job to walk away from. If a cupbearer wanted to leave his position, it was normally seen as a sign of rebellion. And the cupbearer would either be put to death or spend the rest of his life in solitary confinement in prison so he couldn't share the secrets that he knew about the country. It wasn't easy to get out of the position of being the cupbearer. Before Nehemiah could embark on the journey that God had for him and carry out the vision that he saw, he had to get permission from the king. And that's why he prayed, give me success today in the presence of the king. Now, before we read the next passage, I want to point out that there's something else that Nehemiah is hoping to accomplish when he asks, when he talks to the king, besides just getting permission to leave. He's not just asking permission to give up his job, take a leave of absence to go. He's also looking for backing for his vision. What he's about to do is going to cost something. And he says, I need someone with unlimited funds, someone who can help me fund the vision that God has given me. I love watching the show Shark Tank. How many of you like Shark Tank? Raise your hand. How many like that show? I love Shark Tank. Thank you. I didn't even ask. I love watching the show Shark Tank. If you've never seen that, Shark Tank is a show where, now, if I slaughter this, my kids are going to let me hear about her. Entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs, I, I, I messed it up last week and, and I, I, you know, I, I didn't hear the end of it all week. Entrepreneurs. It's a show where entrepreneurs appear before a panel of investors to pitch their ideas and hopefully get funding to help them launch their new products. Nehemiah doesn't have a product, but he does have a vision. Now, in Shark Tank, if you just go with a vision, you're not going to get anywhere. They want to actually see the product. They want to see it work. They want to have samples of it. They want to know that it's been tested, that people are actually going to buy this thing. He just has the vision, but he wants the king to buy in to his vision. So today, he goes to the shark tank to face the king and sell the king on his vision. So in Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, we read this. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when he, wine was brought before him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before. So the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you were not ill, this can be nothing but sadness of heart. And I was very much afraid. Now, why would Nehemiah be afraid? I already mentioned one of those things a minute ago. You know, if you ask to get out of your position, the king could see that as a sign of disloyalty. So he's probably fearful for his life. <clears throat> But another good reason was simply the fact that the king noticed that he was sad. See, there was an actually a law in Persia that said it is illegal to be sad in the presence of the king. The king wanted to be happy. He wanted to have a smile. I mean, they had court jesters to try to cheer the king up when the king was sad. To make the king sad, that was a capital offense. You could actually be put to death for not having a smile on your face in the presence of the king. And the king said, why are you so sad? So immediately he goes, whoa, 
I'm sad in front of the king. This is not a good thing. I can't be sad. He says he had never, and we don't know exactly how many years he'd been working there. He had never before been sad in the presence of the king, because even if he had sadness of heart, he was good at masking that. He was able to paste a smile on his face and keep that smile. But this time the king saw it. By not hiding his inner unrest, Nehemiah was taking the risk of inciting the king's wrath. His unhappiness could have been interpreted as disloyalty or disapproval with what the king was doing. But Nehemiah had already asked God for favor, and God granted that favor. Nehemiah was the king's trusted advisor. So the king chose to overlook Nehemiah's appearance and even expressed concern. Instead of the king saying, how dare you be sad in my presence? Don't you know that's a capital offense? Guards, take him away. The king actually was concerned. He saw that and God actually used that. And the king said, why are you sad? Why does your face look like that? The king knew Nehemiah well enough to know that if Nehemiah is sad, there must be a good reason for it. It's actually God moving to give him favor with the king because that's what he had asked for. The king says, why do you look so sad? Now, I don't think Nehemiah was purposely looking sad. As I said, it it could be a capital offense. I don't think he said, I'm going to put on my saddest face so the king will notice how sad I am. And then maybe he'll, you know, ask me why I'm sad. And then I can lead into a conversation. I think it was just the things were so heavy on his heart that it finally came out. I mean, he had been sad for four months. For four months, he had been weeping and pouring his heart out to God. He had been heartbroken for four months. But now it got so big that he couldn't hide it any longer. It just came out. He also probably was a little bit deep in thought thinking, you know, because he was going to go and ask the king to let him have a leave of absence and ask the king for financing for the trip. So those are probably weighing heavily because he didn't even know how the king was going to have that. And so it may not actually been sadness and it may have been, been a little bit more fear. that How is the king going to take this conversation? Will I have a job tomorrow? Will I even have a, my life tomorrow? But his expression, his countenance gave something away. God opened the door. By using his countenance and by having the king ask the question. But Nehemiah still had to walk through the door. So still fearful of how the news may be perceived by the king, Nehemiah answered the king's question. Verse 3, he said, May the king live forever. But why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed? By fire. (coughs) So the king said to me, what is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven. Now he'd been praying for four months. And this is one of those quick prayers, probably not even out loud where the king is here. But in his prayer, okay, God, give me the right words here. Let this come out the way that it needs to come out. So a quick, silent prayer to God. I prayed to the God of heaven, and then I answered the king. If it pleases the king... And if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. Now notice what he asks for. He doesn't just say, could I have some vacation time? Could I take a leave of absence? He actually says, may the king send me. Can I go out with your blessing? Can I go out, go out underneath your authority? That's important because the king is going to grant him what he asks for. The description of the Bible says you have not because you ask not. Sometimes we don't have the desires of our heart because God wants to give us the desires of our heart. As long as our heart's desires are God's desires, God wants to give us the things that he's placed in our heart. But sometimes we don't ask for the right things. And if we don't ask, Sometimes we're not going to receive. I think sometimes God's saying, hey, I got these things I want to give you. Why don't you just ask for them? But we go ask everybody else instead of asking the one who can give us what we want. Let him, the king, send me. Verse 6, then the king, with the queen sitting beside him, asked me, how long will your journey take? And when will you get back? And it pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. Now, it doesn't tell us here how much time Nehemiah requested, but Jerusalem was approximately $900 from where they were at at the time. 
It would take in those days about three months to travel that 900 miles. So he's asking for at least three months to get there and three months to get back, plus whatever time he needs to build the city. So it's fair to assume he's asking for at least a year off. Now we find out later when he started adding things up, he was actually gone for 12 years. So did he know that up front? Did he ask the king, could I take off for 12 years? Or did he say, uh, could I have a year and then we'll, ta- we'll, then we'll see what happens. I'll, I'll, I'll keep in contact with you. I'll let you know if I need to, but can we set up for a year initially? Was he asking for extensions? We're not told that, but he told the king and it's fair to assume it was at least a year. And the king says, okay. And we find out later that this was not just an unpaid leave of absence. He actually left for 12 years, and he received his full salary, which was a lot, from the king for the 12 years that he is doing what God's asked him to do. Now, can you imagine going to your boss and saying, can I have 12 years off with pay so I can go work for God? Can you imagine what would happen, especially when your boss is not a believer? The king of Persia was not a Christian man. He was a pagan. And yet Nehemiah goes to him and says, can I take 12 years off with pay to go do what God has asked me to do? And the king says, yeah, no problem. Go. That's the God we serve. See, when it's God's will, when God lays something on our heart, God will provide. We just need to say, yes, God, I will join your vision. I will do what you ask me to do and trust God and take care of the rest. Now, if the story stopped right here, it would already be a great story. But Nehemiah isn't done asking yet. I mean, Moses said, thank you. I'm out of here tomorrow. But Nehemiah's not done. Verse 7, he says, if it pleases the king, may I also have letters to the governors of trans-Euphrates? so that they will grant me safe conduct until I arrive in Judah? And may I have a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the royal park, so that he will give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel by the temple and for the city wall and for the residence that I will occupy? (coughs) And because the gracious hand of my God was on me, the king granted my requests. Nehemiah knows that all this success has nothing to do with him. It isn't because he's such an eloquent speaker that he wowed the king with his vision. It isn't simply because he's earned the king's trust over the years, although I'm sure that helped. The whole reason Nehemiah is successful on this day and for the rest of the story is because of God's favor. He had asked God for favor and God granted favor. Favor. And he says that because the hand of God was upon me. Nehemiah knows that everything he's doing is because of God. He has nothing to do with it. He is just the humble servant, just the vessel that God is using. But all the success is given by God. Having God's favor doesn't always guarantee. Just having the favor doesn't guarantee success either. We have God's favor as we do what God asks us to do. Because see, sometimes we want God just to bless us. But Nehemiah has favor because he is also doing. God's favor comes to us when we're doing what God asks us to do. Not simply because, you know, we're so wonderful that God just wants to bless us. Yes, God does love us. But God wants oh obedience and his favor, his provision follows our obedience. The whole plan that Nehemiah had wasn't his plan. It was God's plan. God had placed it in his heart. Nehemiah was simply stepping out in faith and doing what God asked him to do one step at a time. And as he followed God's guidance, God provided what he needed every time he needed it. 95 years before this story, (coughs) God had announced to Daniel in Daniel chapter 9 that a decree would go out to rebuild Jerusalem. Now, a decree was something that had to come from a king. 
And Daniel didn't just prophesy that the gates were going to be rebuilt. He said there will be a decree that the walls will be rebuilt. And that's what the letters that Nehemiah requested were. Said, will you give me letters? Will you send me out? Give me proper documentation so that this doesn't just become a release for me to do this. This is actually a decree from the kingdom. This has the backing of the whole country. It's got the backing of the king. He is doing it, well, because of God. But most people wouldn't listen to that. I mean, how many, how many get very good results when you tell somebody, God told me? We use that as an excuse somehow, well, God told me to do this. And as believers, we have trouble arguing with that. Even if I have people all the time come tell me, God told me to do this or God told me to do that, and I don't even know what to say. You know, well, if God already told you to do it, why are you asking me? You know, if you're coming to me and asking my advice, you must be questioning whether or not God actually asked you to do it. Because if it's God, just go out and do it. You know, I can't argue with God. But people of the world, they don't care what God says. You know, it's like, remember our story of Moses? He went to the Pharaoh and he says, God says, let the Israelites go. And Pharaoh says, God, are you talking about? I don't know this God. I'm in charge of the gods. No God could come and tell me what to do because I'm the leader of the gods. That's what Pharaoh thought he was. So the king is actually saying, this is now my mission. You are going out as a representative of me. I decree that the walls will be rebuilt. The letters didn't just get permission, it actually commissioned Nehemiah as the king's agent to oversee the project. Nehemiah's plan, Nehemiah's vision didn't originate with him. It originated with God. Nehemiah was simply the tool that God used to carry out his plan here on earth. And that's what we need to keep in mind because we're always praying. In fact, Jesus taught us to pray, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we think that's just automatically going to happen. It's just magically God's will is going to be accomplished on earth. No, that's not what it means. God always works through people. God has a plan. But we have to make that plan happen. We have to pray for God's vision. And then we have to come underneath that vision. My voice is squeaking. I think I'll have enough to get through here. We have to come underneath that vision, and God's will gets accomplished when we do our part. Praying, it starts with prayer, but it doesn't end with prayer. It ends with us getting involved and playing the part that God asks us to play. God can do anything he wants, anytime he wants to do it. But he almost always chooses to do it through us. Without us getting involved, it won't happen, even though God wants to do it. What if Moses had said no to God when God appeared to them in the burning bush? Now, he did actually try to say no, and you know, we'll have, you have to go back and listen to that story again. <laughs> he said no several times, but God wouldn't take no for an answer. And finally, Moses said, okay, yes, I will go do it. The Israelites would have still been in slavery if Moses hadn't answered the call and got involved. God said, I, I, God said I'm going to do it, but I'm going to do it through you. You go, and together we'll make this happen. When we catch God's vision and take part in God's plan, miracles take place. Miracles don't just happen on their own. We have to do our part. Prayer is a big part of that, but we also have to have faith, and usually we have to put our faith into action before the miracles take place. So not only does the king grant permission for Nehemiah to take the time off to fulfill his vision, the king also properly commissions Nehemiah, so he's actually going out under the authority of the king. And as if that isn't enough, the king sends the cavalry along just in case there's any resistance. So the king said, sure, take all the time off you need. Go out under my commission. You're actually working for me. You get your full salary while you're gone. Here's all the materials that you need. And let me send an army along with you just in case you face any resistance. He hadn't even asked for that. 
The king financed the whole operation. I mean, the, the rocks were already there. They, they reused those, but they needed beams and stuff for the, for the timbers to go above the gates and to build the gates and all that kind of stuff. Now, notice what it says. Nehemiah asked for letters to have the timbers provided from the royal park. Did he catch that? Not just any timbers, from the royal park. That was the park or the forest actually owned by the king. Everything in that forest belonged to the king. The king would normally sell that lumber. Very few people had it just given to them. But Nehemiah says, give me a letter to the manager of the royal park, the royal forest, to provide to me free of charge the lumber that I need to build the walls. And the king gave him those letters. So the king not only is paying the salary of Nehemiah, the salary of all the cavalry that goes with him, the king is also giving out of his own supplies to build the walls. The king is financing the whole operation. God has granted Nehemiah favor with the king. But the task is still too big for Nehemiah to do on his own. I didn't read the part about the cavalry, did I? You have to read that there. It says the king sent the cavalry with him to, to go. The task is too big for him to do on his own. He will lead the effort, but he can't do the job by himself. He needs manpower. He needs people to come behind him to help fulfill the vision. He has to convince the people who are living in Jerusalem, who have been living in that condition, living with that rubble, and complaining about it, some of them, saying this isn't right, but never doing anything. He needs to convince them to come and help him do the task. He's the visionary, but he needs a workforce. Some of those people have been living in Jerusalem for 90 years. Any of them could have attempted to build the wall, but none of them did. They simply said, it's not right. Why can't it be better? Why doesn't somebody do it? Some of them said, oh, it's impossible. If we try to build it, somebody's going to come tear it down again. We might as well not even try because it's just not ever going to happen. Nehemiah has to convince these people who've done nothing for 90 years to get involved and actually do something. Now, verse 10 mentions a couple of guys named Sanballat and Tobiah that aren't too happy about Nehemiah coming to rebuild the walls. And we're going to skip that part for now because I'm going to come back to those two guys um, in, in another message. So we're going to pick up the story again in verse 11. Nehemiah is probably pretty exhausted after traveling for three months. So he rests for three days. How many like to do that after being gone for an extended time? For three days, he did nothing. He just rested for three days. And then he took a few trusted men and went out at night to inspect the walls and evaluate the task before. Remember, up to this point, he had never seen it. He'd heard about it, but he had never seen it. He had a vision for what could be but he didn't know exactly what he's looking at yet. He just knew it was a pile of rubble. <coughs> so in verse 11, it says, I went to Jerusalem. After staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few others. I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except the one I was riding. That means he was the only one that had a camel or a horse or a donkey or whatever. Everybody else was on foot. And it would have taken several nights to do this on foot. It's not nothing that he could have done in one day. It would have taken several days. By night, I went out through the valley gate towards the jackal, well, and the dung gate, examining the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down, and its gates, which had been destroyed by fire. Then I moved on towards the fountain gate and the king's pool, but there was not enough room for my mount to get through. So there was so much destruction, he couldn't even get his horse through there. So I went up to the valley by night, examining the wall. Finally, I turned back, re-entered through the valley gate. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, because as yet, of yet I had said nothing to the Jews or to the priests or nobles or officials or any others who would be doing the work. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we're in. Jerusalem lies in ruins. He's not telling them something they don't know. They know what's there. He says, you see it. Jerusalem lies in ruins. Its gates have been burned with fire. Come. Come. Let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be in disgrace. And I talked about that last week. What does that mean to be in disgrace? That's what his brother had come when he said. He didn't just talk about the rubble, didn't just talk about the walls being destroyed. He said the people are living in disgrace, and that's because they didn't have a wall. And, and in those days, that wall around the city, that was part of what made the people proud. It's what showed God's favor upon them. I'm not going to get all into that again this time because we talked about that last week. Go back and listen to that from last week's message. But he says, let's get this. Let's do this. Let's stop being in disgrace. 
Let's do something together. Let's rebuild this city. Then I also told him about the gracious hand of God on me and what the king had said to me. So he said, hey, I've got a vision from God. And I got some testimonies here to help get you excited. You know, the king gave me the time off. The king provided the timbers. The team, I mean, he's, he's just going through and tell him all that. People are, wow, this must be God. Because look, God's favor is already upon him. And they replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. A city that had been in ruins for over 150 years is now being rebuilt. But it's not rebuilding itself. God didn't just all of a sudden say, the walls come up. The people had to do it. God's vision through Nehemiah. But it's happening. It's happening because one man, Nehemiah, was willing to step out of his comfort zone and roll up his sleeves and do something that looked impossible on the surface. Most of the other people who looked at the condition of the walls said it's destroyed too badly. There's nothing that anybody can do. No good can ever come of this. But Nehemiah looked beyond the rubble and said, I see what God sees. I see a restored city. With God, nothing is impossible. God doesn't see rubble. God sees potential. God has great plans. God's in the construction business, not the destruction business. That's the devil's job. The devil comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. That's not God's job description. God either builds from nothing or rebuilds from rubble. We don't have to accept the rubble. God wants to rebuild it, but it takes vision. It takes somebody seeing the rubble and saying, what can I do about this? And then listening to God and doing what they say. And everybody won't be a Nehemiah. There was only one Nehemiah. But the rest of the people had to get behind his vision. They had to say, let's do this together. Too many people are looking for a person to save the world. If we just get the right president, if we just get the right governor, if we just get the right pastor, we want somebody, that's their job description, to fix it. Well, you know what? We want the right person with a God-given vision. That's true. Because the vision comes through the leader. And sometimes it's God's vision, sometimes it's not God's vision. Okay? Vision always comes to the leader. And that's one of the biggest things you can do is pray for your leaders. Pray for me that I will have God's vision for this church, that I will have God's vision for this city. But the vision, the things don't happen because the president has a vision or because the governor has a vision or because the pastor has a vision. The work only gets done when we come together and we say, yes, we will join in that vision. We will do the work to make this happen. It takes all of us working together. Maybe you look around and maybe you see rubble. I don't know what rubble you see because there's lots of places you can look for rubble. Maybe you look at your school and you see, man, this school is messed up. Maybe you look at the city of Yakima and say, man, the city of Yakima needs help. Those are both true statements. Maybe you're looking somewhere else. You're seeing the destruction. You're seeing what the enemy has done. You're hearing about the good old days and the way God's hand used to be upon stuff. And that's not what you're seeing when you look out there. You're saying, this is a mess. Yeah, it is. What are you going to do about it? Now, maybe God's going to call you to be a Nehemiah. Maybe God's going to give you the vision. You're going to see the finished product. And God's going to say, you lead it. You, get, you recruit some other people and you start something because there's nothing there. Or maybe you just need to seek God say, God, who's already working towards this? Who can I partner with to make this happen? But the world's not going to become better just by wishing. The world's not even going to become better just by praying. We need to pray, yes. But we need to go beyond prayer. We need to say, what can I do? What is God calling me to lead? 
Or what is God calling me to be a part of? What is my part? And we can't all do, it, do everything. But if each of us does something, if each of us gets involved somewhere, the church becomes a better place. The city becomes a better place. The world becomes a better place. But it takes all of us. It takes the people saying, yes, we together, we will do this. The enemy has knocked down walls, but God wants to rebuild them. He's just waiting for people to see what he sees, to look past the rubble and see the perfect world that God imagines. Now, that'll never happen until we're totally with him. I know that, okay? This world is not just going to become better and better and better. We're not kingdom now, okay? There are, there's a, a kingdom now theology going around which, which says that the world's going to become better and better and better and better and usher in God's kingdom. That's not what the Bible teaches. But it does teach that we need to do what we can while we're here. And instead of just saying, well, it's all going to be destroyed anyway, so we'll just let it go that way. We all need to get involved. And when we get involved, it becomes better. God already has everything laid out. God already has the plan. God's already given the prophecies. He had given the prophecy to Daniel 95 years before this time. God already has the plan. But who is going to step up and help work his plan? He will give whatever favor is necessary when we step out in faith. Is he okay? You're beginning to do it. Now I'll give you what you need. He usually doesn't provide it before we need it. He provides our daily bread. We're saying, well, when I get, when I have enough money, I'll do it. When I have enough time, I'll do it. When I have enough, no. God's saying, do it. You simply step out and face it. God, I don't know how you're going to fund this thing. I don't know. But God, I trust you. You're asking me to get involved. I will do it. And then God will give you what you need when you do it. We're going to close the song, and the song probably has nothing to do with the message today. That's okay. In fact, if you don't want to sing, you don't have to sing. We're just going to do one song together. And during the song, pray and ask God. Say, God, open my eyes to see the rubble around me. Maybe you've already seen the rubble. If you have, just say, God, show me what I can do to help rebuild this. Because if you're seeing it, it's probably God saying, you're supposed to be a part of that project. God, show me what I can do. Show me what my part is. And not just talking about it. Not just praying about it. But show me what part I can play in actually making it better. And maybe God will ask you to be a Nehemiah. Maybe God will just say, you just need to get behind the vision. I've already given somebody else and you need to support them. They, they have the vision. You just become the workforce to make it happen. But God, where is my place in your kingdom? What task have you called me to do? And let's just put ourselves on the altar. Say, God, I'm yours. Use me as your vessel to change this world. And Heavenly Father, I pray that you would speak to us before we leave this place this morning. I pray that you speak to every person in this room. Some of us have been sitting back for too long. Some of us used to be involved, but we've gotten discouraged or we've gotten tired. Some have never been involved because they just don't think they can make a difference. God, show us what we can do, because every one of us can do something. It might not be the same thing we did 20 years ago. It may be something totally different. You may move us to a different part of the wall to rebuild. But help us to hear from you. What are you asking from us? And let us say, yes, God, I will do my part. I will be part of making a difference. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.